Welcome to Issaquah Christian Church. Okay, I've got a question for you. What's the first thing that comes to mind, so I need your feedback, uh, when you hear the word leadership or leader? First thing that comes to mind. Ooh, yeah, me. Okay. What? The president. Huh? Ownership. All right. Example, yeah. Uh, the guy in front, okay. Right? Yeah, I love the, the line, he who thinks he leads with no one following is only taking a walk. <laughs> I look behind me a lot. I'm like, oh, <laughs> do I want to know? First, she'll be last. Yeah. Leadership has, um, has a bad reputation sometimes, though, for good, for good reasons, right? Because there's a sense that, that we're not always sure what the leader wants from us is kind of the experience. I want to talk about that a little bit today, just the whole, the whole idea. Uh, leadership in America, you said president, you know, it starts to get into this fuzzy sort of thing. Um, we, just, we just want someone, we just want someone who will do it for us, a king or something like that. There's a this sort of drift into just publicly authoritarian leadership. It's like, just someone just do it, just just can we hire you and will you just do it and then we don't have to think too much about it. Actually, one of our presidents way, way back in the day is quoted as saying that our Constitution, this is John Adams, was made only for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Like if, if they don't partic- if you don't have a people that basically want the good for one another, then this sort of give and take where government does its thing and the people does its thing, it turns into just this kind of scary, authoritarian thing that some of us kind of want because it's a little bit easier if someone else just makes the decisions for us, et cetera, right? Leadership is just tricky. Um, it's, it's tricky. Galen, I remember this kid, Galen Roque, I was uh, leading in student ministry and, and this young leader guy, I was like, oh man, you're, you're, an, you're a great leader. I'd love to see you take more leadership in the youth group. And, and he's like, I don't know, I don't want to be a leader. Like, you don't want to be a leader. Well, you are a leader, but okay, you don't want to be a leader. He says, leader, leaders always want something from other people. And I was like, oh, so you, you got that. But a good leader actually wants things for the people, not from them, right? And there's an example piece that like Kirk was saying. There's some, some other things in there that, that we, want to, we want to pull out. Leadership isn't necessarily even the best word, but I just use it because because it's a very common thing, you know. You've had a lot of education about that in school, and you've had, you know, you got the leaders, and you got the followers, and you got this whole, it becomes a little bit confusing. But leadership, basically, leaders are supposed to, this is what we want, they communicate some sort of energy and productivity, and enthusiasm, effectiveness to, to the people around them. Um, but which is basically like friendship, <laughs> if you think about it. It just really is just a friendship. Like, oh, wow, that's exciting. I want to be excited about that too. Or, oh, it looks like you're doing some things. I want to be a part of that too. So it doesn't have to be the big scary word. Like, hey, I'd like you to lead that. Like, well, no, I don't lead though. I don't, I don't lead things. Well, can you communicate enthusiasm? And, and can you move in a direction and encourage other people to say, hey, check this out. I mean, right? The, the, at some level, we all have some sphere of influence and and it's kind of it kind of happens best when you're not thinking about it i don't think we should do a class necessarily on on leadership christian leadership i think we're just supposed to look to to jesus and then just go together with him i don't know we could we could have a conversation about it but it it begins to be kind of a confusing topic and then it starts to say oh, well what are you trying to get us to do And I think we should just get into Scripture and kind of think through this here because there's some effective principles that come out of this. But, but if you're, I don't want you to think this is just for pastors and elders in the church. I want you to think about any area that you have that has some influence where you could invite people to kind of join you in what you're doing, in a friend, even in a friendship sort of way. I, I don't want you to be off the hook for this passage, even though it seems like you're like, oh, yeah. That's fine. Um, I don't need to think about that because I'm not 
one of the elders among you. But let's, so we want to look at the passage and then try to pull out, yeah, what, did le- what does leadership in the church look like? But then also, what are we supposed to be doing as, as the people of God? So here it goes. I exhort you elders, the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. He's he's assuming that if you do these things, this is what's going to happen, as opposed to when the chief shepherd appears and says, what was that all about? (laughs) You're like, oh, (laughs) whoops. But but when the chief shepherd appears, because you've done these things, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. This is all of you. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. So this is clearly written to the elders. I exhort the elders among you. But then there's an all of you in here as well, right? The humility that all of us... So, I'd like you just to think with me, if, if you could, what are some areas in your life where you provide leadership? That kind of friendship, that enthusiasm, that, hey, let's, let's, we're going to do this thing together, where you have influence. Some of you have, um, I don't know of any like, specific like, social media influencers in here. If, if, you, if so, I'm sorry, I haven't followed you. I'm, I'm, you know, but, like, but if you're thinking about like what sphere of influence you have, you've got a few people around you, right? So what are some areas of leadership that that as you're thinking about this passage, you could say, oh, that might apply to this sort of area of my life. So what are some areas? Parenting. That's a big big part of of life is is influence and exercising um, leadership in that way. What are some other areas? Grandparenting. Ooh, up a notch. Great grandparenting, anybody? Okay, in the back, we got great grandparenting. Yeah. What are some other areas where you, you're, you see leadership, even if it's not on a global scale? Coaching. Yeah, that's huge. All right. Trade skills. Yeah. 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 That apprenticing process where you're where you're offering the new things. Yeah, I, I'm basically trying to get you all to put yourselves on the hook with me. <laughs> you notice what I'm doing here. Like, see, this is you too. This is, this is as you lead your work team or as you've been given a little example. You know, this is, this is part of your job here together. So to, to shepherd the flock of God, though, this is clearly about Christian ministry and, and leadership in the church, which you have to think these are house churches, these are house churches where you would have babies making noises and it would be a lovely thing and nobody would care at all because yay babies, right? I mean, you're in a house church where, where you've got, um, you know, in this section of town, there's people who meet in this house and a section of town where people meet in that house and, and so there's elders among you. Um, but, but here's some, some easy takeaways. I mean, really, these are just laying kind of right on the surface of the text. Some do this, but not like that. Do this, but not that. And it's be shepherds, but not lords. Shepherds. Be a shepherd, not a lord. Um, Jesus said to Peter this one time during his, his uh, kind of restoration of, of Peter, who, who's a young married man who was still trying to figure life out. And, and he said, shepherd the flock, or feed my sheep, he said. Feed my sheep. So, in an authoritarian mindset, we would say, you, feed me now, right? Like, uh, like Aaron, Pastor Aaron, feed me. Like, okay, yes, I want to feed you, but what are we eating? Well, the Word. And then how are we supposed to do that? Yeah, I want to explain it to you, but then also, here's this thing that's been pesky in my mind, and I just have to lay it on you now. Um, where... Where do we see sheep being hand-fed in the Bible? 
Is there, are there any places where, where as an analogy, like I'm spoon feed as the, the shepherd, I'm spoon feeding the sheep. To feed the sheep, what does that actually mean? I, pastor, I just have to leave the church now. I have to go to other places because I'm just not being fed. Right? I'm not being fed. Like, okay. Okay, hold yourself. Hold yourself back, Aaron, and just say, I'm sorry to hear that. I know we want you to be fed for sure. And you're leaving because you're not being fed. Are sheep supposed to be hand fed? What, what, are, what do we do with sheep? You lead them to greener pastures, right? Anyway, just a challenge to, to me. I, I thank you for the therapy session. I mean, it's just, it's such, a, it's such a struggle. We're supposed to care for and guide the flock that's entrusted to us. Uh, the shepherd would, would go before the sheep. The shepherd would do this. He would um, put the sheep in a pen and then mark out where he's going. Tomorrow we're going to greener pastures. And so what would the shepherd do? He would go and remove obstacles, tree branches, rocks that didn't need to be there so that on the next day he could lead that flock to a greener pasture so that they could have still water and, and uh, green pasture to, to feed in. Um, but you'd still, you have to do your own chewing, right, <laughs> at some level. <laughs> and and uh, like, there's not a lot of spoon feeding in, in the Bible. I just want to challenge that notion when you leave the church uh, after this service. And you say, I'm out, Pastor. You're just not feeding me well. I'm like, oh, okay, but tell, let's, can we have a bigger dialogue about what that means? Because I want you to learn how to, to explore the Scripture. and We want you to learn how to read in, in community with one another. We want you to learn how to do these things as well. Um, so hopefully we can lead you to greener pastures for sure. But I want you to think about this too. What is the goal of shepherding? Now, the role of a shepherd is kind of obvious. You protect, provide, you lead them, you guide them. But what's the goal of shepherding? What's that? Multiplying. Yeah. What else? Why, 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 why have a herd? Why have a flock? What is the whole point of all that? Growing into maturity, yeah. Uh, keeping them safe, yeah. But, the, but why do you want them safe at all? I guess because the chief shepherd says that you should keep them safe, yeah? Yeah? Uh, let's use you for wool, not meat, but yes. Yes, 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 yes. Me, uh, wool, milk, and multiplying the flock. Maturity means that you're multiplying. So at the, end of the, at the end of a season, what you're hoping for is that those sheep got together and made little baby sheep, right? And then, the, so the flock is multiplying and that there's milk and wool for the sustenance of the community. Yeah, healthy, healthy sheep to that end, right? I mean, not just because you care about the individual sheep, and of course there's a responsibility to the chief shepherd, but the goal is to, to see the flock multiply. That's what greener pastures would look like, is where is the flock multiplying? How is the, how is the group um, developing in maturity and so that they, so we can produce more milk and wool. And if you transfer that to the kingdom mindset or to the church mindset, the leadership should be moving us to Christian maturity, which is like Christ, which is all these things that we just talked about. Good for the community, good for the people around us, and multiplying so that our, your faith doesn't just stop with you. Right? That it, grow, it grows. And, and like I've said uh, many times, training is available for this. This doesn't come necessarily just obviously, um, we are we're actively and consistently training disciple makers, right? We'll start a new training center for disciple makers here in a few weeks. Uh, and, and we'll invite you to a kind of a vision cast to talk about these things and say, is this something that, that you want to do with your life that God's challenging you to do, to multiply, to grow into that uh, overall Christian maturity? So that's, that's something to really think about. As you're shepherding, you're, you're wanting you're going to lead, guide, provide, um, but not just, you, you, don't just, you don't beat the sheep, obviously. You guide. Not lording it over, but, but to guide. In, in the ancient world, the, the kings were called shepherds. That was a normal kind of thing, but don't, don't shepherd like the ones over there that just beat. 
uh, beat the sheep. The second thing is to serve willingly, not for personal gain. Okay, that's, that makes sense. Um, now, I do, do note, there's an asterisk here, I do take a salary. You know. um, but why do I do it? Or why does, a, why does an elder do it? Why do you do Christian leadership? It comes down to that whole thing. And it's serving with a willing heart. Um, not, not out of desire for personal gain. That le- a Christian leader should not be motivated by selfish ambitions. This is sort of, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not so obvious. Right now, <laughs> the, the temptation and, and really the expectation is for Christian leaders to create a brand for who they are and then use the people to make a name for yourself. It really, <laughs> if you just, just step back and think about it, and now raise your hand if you think I'm just way off. But the temptation for Christian celebrity and really the expectation for Christian celebrity is that we want our, I don't know, pastor, leader, we want our worship leader, we want our whatever, to, to, we want to see them kind of go on this J-curve of like, you know, Look at them. See, see, our pastor's a famous pastor. I'm not saying that's happening in this church. I'm just saying that's a general interesting tendency of a desire for celebrity. They're, they're hoisted on the shoulders of the people, and it's not really certain if the people will let them down. <laughs> or they need, do the people need a celebrity to be on their shoulders, to be that point person, the tip of the spear, the, the, the celebrated person, because it becomes a trap. I mean, you don't have to look terribly far, even in our city, you know, the, the greater Northwest here, to see how celebrity corrupts. So we have to be careful what we wish for. Like, oh, we want to, we want to become that mega church, or we want to become this. Oh, like we want to do that. But you have to, you have a soul, and you have to remember the shape. <laughs> Your soul is taking some shape, and we have to be careful with that too. So serve willingly, not for personal gain. And I don't just mean cash and the ridiculous jokes we can make about private jets and all that kind of stuff. But but just, is this for you? I have to challenge myself. I mean, none of you, you, there aren't too many of you who are like, put me on the stage, put me on the stage. Most of you are like, you do it, I don't want to do it. But I have to choose, to make. I have to make a transition. Am I the same person there as I am here? And am I going to, do damage to my soul. I talk with Izzy about this. We talk with Christian leaders about this all the time. What damage is happening to your soul when you come out from a stage and do a thing? And is that consistent with who you are in the everyday stuff of life? We have to be careful about that. You have to be careful about that. Don't go into Christian mode or go into pastor mode. We have to be careful about that. And it's something I've really, uh, I've just become aware of because I've seen, I've seen a lot of decay and a lot of people who just don't live, don't, don't live the same when they're on stage as when they're somewhere. We have to be very, very careful for our own self. Or maybe that looks like for you, like I got to go into Christian mode right now. I've got I've to I've act Christianly. Like, oh. Talked about this a few weeks ago. It's easy to act like a Christian. It's very difficult to react like a Christian. And so when you react unchristianly, okay, just call it for what it is. Wow, there's some deep work, Jesus, I need you to do in my heart right now. Because that is apparently what comes out. When, when you're carrying, like me, a crock pot of, of hot pulled pork, that's just, a, just that's what we're having for lunch. Um, when you're carrying that, if you bump me, what's, you know, what spills out? Well, it's kind of whatever is in the crock pot, right? And that's the, that's the reaction. And so we don't have to be ashamed and, and hurt ourselves any more than just that you got covered in hot liquid or something like that. What you need to do is just say, Jesus, so thank you for exposing that in my heart. Thank you for helping me understand what's latent, what's, what's deep inside of me. 
I confess that, of course. Obviously, that was gross. Whatever just happened, that was terrible. I didn't like what happened there. But I just admit that to you, and I want to live more lined up with reality and integrity and who I really am in, in you. So we have to be careful both ways. Serve willingly, not for personal gain. Why am I here? Why are you here? What are we doing in this in Christian community? Just to serve out of the gifts and strength that God has given to you. Um, and be careful not to put your Christian leaders on a pedestal to where they can't say, hey, actually, that's not who I really am. <laughs> and you say, no, 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 you just stay there. I'll shiny. That's who I need you to be. And you can have your soul decay within you. I don't give a rip because you need to be that kind of person for me. You can't have problems. Oh, okay. I mean, if you tell me I can't have problems, first of all, I have to walk out the door right now. But, but if you tell me I can't have problems or I can't be going through the normal stuff of life, I can't have a weird, awful day when I'm grieving the loss of my teenage daughter, or I can't, you know, you can't, you can't have a problem, Pastor. Oh, really? Well, then, uh, I guess we're done here because I, I, I'm either going to just decay inside and pretend, and that's sometimes what you do too, isn't it? Smile, Christian. Everything's fine, Christian. Just the joy of the Lord, Christian. Yeah. I mean, your wife's got a diagnosis, but just, just smile your way through. No, oh, that's a bad day. And Jesus knows it's a bad day. And so let him walk through. He's, he's, he's changing us. He's saving us from the inside out. Lord, have mercy. Uh, lead eagerly, not a forced sort of thing, not under compulsion, not... Not force, well, I guess i got to do this, but just lead eagerly with enthusiasm. Um, there's, there's joy to be found in leadership and in, in loving the people of God. And it's, it hurts too, but there are seasons, there are times when um, we're like, well, I guess i got to do it. Pastor, if that's what the role you need me to play, then I guess I'll do it, but I'm not going to do it happily. Well, then stop. Please, stop. Stop. No. Just, just let's, let's do anything we do. We learned this just a few verses ago. Anything we do, any gift that we have that we offer should come out of the strength that God provides. If it's something you're doing because you just got to do, do it and, and you really don't like people, or you need God to change, change your heart. Now, I'm not saying it's about feelings. You can love your spouse. You can love his action, right? You do the things that are, that are loving, not whether or not you feel it. You know, I don't get credit for telling my wife, today I'm just trying to be more authentic with you. I was going to make the bed and fold the laundry, or, but I just didn't feel it, and I want you to know that I'm only going to do things that are authentic. So I just sat on my butt and watched the game because authentically, I know that's what you really want from me. I'm like, yeah, I don't do that, actually. I'm smarter than that. Um, so we do things because it's the right thing to do, and it, sometimes your heart's not in it, whatever. But, but we don't want to, le- to, to lead in a way that, I'm, well, I'm just kind of being forced to do it. You, gotta, you can't provide encouragement and enthusiasm if you don't have that, too. So there's a bit of a tension there. Um, be examples, Kirk brought that up, not authoritarians. So setting, setting an example. Do as I do. <laughs> you know, we grew up, some of us grew up with do as I say, not as I do. You know. Um, but no, you set, you set the example. You, you have so many opportunities to set the example. And, and if you just think about the areas that God has given you influence, you have opportunities all the time. As elders, leaders, and pastors, of course, we have these opportunities as well. As Timothy's, that's our, the name for our disciple makers, you have tons of opportunities to, to set the example. We're, we're coming into a day and age where institutional authority is constantly questioned. Where I am not, like you could bring me into your neighborhood for a little meet and greet with a pastor and have a chat and nobody would show up because he's a pastor, he's part of the establishment, it's the institution, there's nothing to him, right? That's, that's not, a, that's, that's not, I don't gain, just so you know, when I flash that card, I don't gain instant trust in a crowd. <laughs> is that kind of obvious? Um, but then there's positional authority. So institutional authority seems to be kind of going away. And you know positional authority. Well, I'm your manager, and I tell you, you have to do this thing. And you're like, okay, 
I guess I have to do this thing. That's positional authority. And so many young people in ministry want to have a title so that they can use their positional authority. Can I get, can I get a title so that people have to obey me and have to do what I say or something like that? Like, whew. okay. What's better than institutional authority and better than positional authority? And really, I think the only thing that's going to be effective in this day and age is just spiritual authority. You have a relationship with God that just sings its own song. You have a conversation with God going that tells the whole story. You have obedience to back that up. And when people see that you actually will do what you say you do, and they will say, something's different. I need, a, I need to get a piece of that and figure that out. This is just the way, the way things go. So being examples to the flock is such a huge thing. Um, he says, God is going to honor you. And honor before God is not, though, an excuse for privileged status over other people. So when, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. You've served well. You've done this. That's great. And so you're a servant, a chief servant. That is no reason for exercising privileged status over other people. So... I welcome your feedback because I really don't know what it's like to be on the other side of this table. I don't know what it's like to be on the other side of my desk when we're having a chat about what's going on in your world and what's going on in your life. I don't exactly know what it's like to be on the other side. So I welcome your feedback because I say we're doing this together. We're figuring this out together as brothers and sisters, not as like some sort of parental and child sort of thing. We're doing this together to try to figure this out. What does it look like to take seriously the claims of Jesus when we're in the roles that we're in, in our, in our world? And so if you see these things in me, I want to hear them. If you see like, well, you kind of, you know, you kind of sound forced or um, I'm, I'm challenging. I think you're maybe using us as a platform or I really feel, okay, I need to hear that, right? I need to hear that. The examples to the flock, follow me as I follow Christ, okay? Now, it does say, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. So there is a, there is, there is a, a role for saying, okay, I believe that God has placed you in this church at, for such a time as this, I need to listen to what you had to say. And I, because you're older, because you're an elder, there's an example to be made. And this goes totally against the cult of youth in our society who wants to be forever 21. You know, the, the, the society is just trying to, trying to be younger, younger, younger because we, for some reason, don't respect the, the aged. It doesn't, doesn't make sense, but we, we have a bias toward youth. And Scripture is saying, submit yourselves. But again, it doesn't say elders go subject the younger people either. You see the mutuality in that? It's not, it's not go lord it over them. No, it's you willingly subject yourself and say, I need to learn. I want to become like Jesus. And that's where this humility comes in. Humble yourselves, not be proud. All of you should clothe, it says, should clothe yourselves with humility. Think about what you put on this morning, and don't, don't answer any of these questions out loud, but, and tell me why you chose what you wore, you know? Sometimes we dress to impress, we dress to lower people's expectations of us, we dress to, I mean, whatever, whatever the reasons are, right? Back then and now, it would be a brand, it would be a, a status symbol when you show up to your house church. Think about the house church. Okay, you're a little overdressed to come to a house to talk to, you know, to talk to Jesus. But what are you doing? Well, you got braided hair and you got the gold and you got the, wow, you're really showing, showing off. That's not what this is about in this community gathering. So dress to, to, dress to impress only in the sense of clothe yourself with humility, right? Clothe yourself with um, humility. Don't be proud. Don't be proud. I can't 
even comment on this. I don't, I don't even, I can barely even understand what pride is. I think of myself all the time. I'm pretty sure you probably think of yourself all the time. C.S. Lewis, who's just a super smart philosopher guy, he said, it's not so much of thinking less of yourselves. Humility isn't thinking less of yourselves. It's more of just thinking of yourself less. Well, maybe I think of myself less than I did before, but now that we're talking about it, I'm starting to think about myself even, even more. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very challenging, especially when, when you, have, you get to set an example and you get to lead. And I was talking with another pastor, uh, uh, Stephen Hill, who was preaching here uh, this last spring. I was talking with him about the dangers of this because when you set the example, you're sort of out in front. And then it's hard to not just do the things that are exemplary leadership just for the sake of setting the example, instead of it coming out of like your own obedience in your heart, it becomes a tactic. And then you're like, oh man. And so I just, I just lamented with him. Just said, We're in danger. Our souls are in danger. We need to humble ourselves under the, the mighty hand of God that, that he will lift us up. There's, a, there's, a, there's an excitement in leadership that I mentioned, you know, being carried on the crowd and, and having this whole, um, it, wouldn't that be great if, if, if I could be exalted in, in, in some sort of way like that? Isn't that what Christians are called to do? Just from glory to glory, from, from you know, we're just getting better and better and we're getting, we're getting more noticed and more noticed and isn't this just kind of an amazing thing? And guess what the chief shepherd is trying to do this entire time? Reduce our strength as leaders so that we can become an example of His grace and His glory and His strength made perfect in our weakness. <laughs> so here, all the time we're like, yeah, it's going to get better and better and better. And He's like, well, and better, yes, but it's going to look like this. My strength is going to be made perfect in your weakness. So we find ourselves at odds with God because we think we know what it looks like to be humble and we know what it looks like to be proud and we just have to entrust ourselves to to the one who actually does know what's going on. He actually says, pick up everything that's bothering you. Everything that's weighing you down. And fling them onto God's back because He will carry them. He will be delighted to carry them. Cast your cares. As you lead in any sort of thing, but certainly in the church, um, you, you, will, you will find that not everybody's on the same path at the same time with you. And it's very challenging, as, as you could probably imagine. So if, even for the elders among you and for everybody that's clothing themselves with humility, um, there's just going to be hurt. There's a, you know, there's a nice hashtag, a conversation about church hurt. Right? Church hurt. I've just been hurt by the church. Like, I'm like... I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd. Like, are you kidding me? Like, yes, I do know about this sort of thing. Yeah, I do. I do know. Um, you know, it's been said. You know, some advice given to a pastor. You know, at some point in your ministry, half the people were going to love you, and the other half are just going to wish you had been gone. You're gone. And if you stay there long enough, those people will flip. <laughs> so, tis the tis the role. Is the, is the way it goes. Um, so in doing this, and as you lead in the way of Jesus, it's going to look like a lot like Jesus. Remember the way Jesus led? It wasn't just glory to glory to glory. It was down into suffering and difficulty and then exaltation in due time. This is the story. This is the story. So I just want to encourage you church, um, that you do have areas of leadership and all these things do apply at some level to, to what you're talking about. And they really do apply to elders and, and pastors as well. Um, I consider myself, I mean, I'm, I'm one of the elders of the church. Uh, I've been asked to, to preach and lead more often in different ways than, than others, but, but I'm, not, I'm not the only 
and I'm not the only elder uh, here at this church. In fact, I was hoping, um, Patrick, if you could just come up and just have a little conversation with me about what you've been, um, maybe just your own takeaway here t- today in conversation with me, but but also just kind of what it's been like as an elder in this church for for quite a while. So you're a you're a, you're a Jesus follower. So tell me when that happened. You follow the chief shepherd, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When did yeah. that happen? Uh, I think I truly accepted Jesus into my life. This is during a period of my uh, uh, life with, with uh, my first wife. And when that all fell apart, because during that time, it was a period where everything was, was coming up roses for me. And, and so this was uh, a point where it just caught me by surprise and it was a downward spiral, spiral that I had no control of. And it was like the, the, I hit bottom, but Jesus was there and pulled me up, pulled me up and he never let go and I never let go of him. And then I found, you know, it's kind of like this, the, my saving grace right, right then and there was as at that point and I've never looked back. I mean, I've got a rear view mirror of, in my car that's small, just like it should be, but the windshield of my life with Jesus going forward is all right there and big in front of me. Yeah, thank you. Um, as you think about this specific exhortation to Christian leaders, <laughs> mm. what, what, are, what is something that hit you or that you're, you're thinking of? Because you've been an elder in this church for quite a while, too. Yeah. Um, and we're not, not to comp- you know, trying to be careful not to complain about, like, oh, it's so hard or those certain things. But what is it, what's it been like? Have you noticed some of these sort of challenges in oh yeah in ministry oh yeah because we're we're God's creation and praise be to the creator that we're not made all the same I mean we all have our spiritual gifts and and talents but that's the body of Christ we're not like like it scripture says we're not all one you know uh, ear or eye or something we're all many parts that make up a whole and uh, I've seen that in this church, uh, and it, it's been very, it, it's been life-saving for me. I, and um, I, I'm truly blessed to be a part of this uh, uh, congregation. And for my brothers and sisters out there, you are like family to me. And I do appreciate each and every one of you. I want to highlight for, for you, one thing I've noticed in you as a leader is, is your willingness to, to listen in like so sometimes I'll come to a really quick conclusion about something and maybe oh no I think this is what's going on and you're like I would like to listen to that person and just kind of hear what's going on so if you ever need someone to listen to you and actually care full on like without sn- jumping to judgments this this guy does shepherd like Jesus in that way he really is Patrick does, you really do um, you do a good job with that um, your humility is on display um, but not in a proud sort of way. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, you, you've, I'm just thinking through some of these things, lead eagerly, not forced, examples, yeah. not authoritarian. These are some things I've seen God do in you as well. Um, I wonder if, if you could just, if you have anything other to say about um, just kind of your role as an elder here or invite further conversation with you. Well, the only thing I can say is that when the opportunity or the offer to be an elder was first proposed to me, I was definitely like, no, you know, that's not me. That's not my style. I have too much to work on myself to, to kind of get into those waters. But then uh, a brother who I, I'll remember for the rest of my life and whom I love deeply, he's no longer with, with us, but Dave Falk, Dave Falk, just all he had to say, and this is, I, I, this is I, to this day, I'll say it's the power of the Spirit. And it's amazing how the Spirit works because Dave Falk said to me, just two words. He says, he says, you're a good man. That's all he said. And the Spirit then, then just kind of took those two words and say, okay, I'm a good man. Why am I a good man? Because I love truth. 
I love righteousness. And God is has shown me so much love and he's so so much grace and mercy. I mean, it, it, it kind of set me on this course to, to find those truths that I need in my life. And uh, I, I just attribute it to, the, to those two words that, uh, that the dear man had said to me. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I, I confirm that. You're a good man. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. You know, as you think about these qualities, like I said, we're, kind of, we're all on the hook for this sort of leadership thing. If you're not on the hook, I'd like to get you on the hook. And I would like you to help each other get each other on the hook, in a sense. Um, you know, one, one thing that's a spiritual discipline that I believe is, a, is a just essential is to seek out a mentor. To, to look at someone in this, as, you, as we sit over lunch here in a few minutes, as you, as you look at someone and say, wow, I love the way you follow Christ in this way. Now, none of us are the full picture. So, so we're not saying everything I do and always, always uh, follow, follow me in that way. But we do have to be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. And as that's taking place, then there's good stuff. As I look around the room, there's just gifts of like prayer and, and mercy and love and hospitality and administration and all these different things. As you get time with one another, Ask someone to, hey, can we meet up once a month and have coffee or tea? I'd love to pick your brain on this topic. I see God doing this work in you. I'd love to see what that could look like in my life as well. Because when you ask someone to mentor you, just imagine that happening in your life. Someone asks you, what, what's, what do you normally, what's the first thing you're going to do? Like, uh, I got to, uh, let me get, get some things figured out and then I'll get back to you about, you know, because when, when we, when someone says, hey, I'd like you to teach me how to follow Christ, we start to say like, oh, I should probably learn that a little better before I teach you, right? Um, That's okay. In fact, we should be kind of spurring one another on toward love and good deeds in that sort of way. So one practical way to, to initiate this would be to ask someone to mentor you in a specific area for a certain amount of time. Don't say, can we spend five hours a day together? Because the answer is always no. But could we meet up once? I have a list of questions. Could we meet up again some other time? I've got a list of questions. That values their time, et cetera, et cetera. But in doing that, you spark something. Oh, I better go follow Christ a little better so I can have more people follow me in the way I'm following Christ and make that a good thing about life, right? So that's a really good impulse thing that will start to ripple throughout the church. You can ask one of your elders, I know Mike, or Patrick, or myself, hey, I, I need some help in this, or I would love to pray with you about this. And, and we'd be like, yes, wow, awesome. That's so great. We would love to do that, of course. But just as you look around, there are lots of gifts, many diverse, distributed, grace of God gifts in this church. So, so push on that a little bit. And it'll start a nice, wonderful, healthy, holy ripple that people will be like, let me get myself together. And then, yes, let's get back together. That sounds wonderful. Um, but we all start following Jesus a little bit better. So that's one takeaway. But I know you have your own takeaways. The Spirit of God will say, yeah, maybe I need to just throw my weight and the hurt of my weight on the shoulders of Jesus and let him bear it. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Let me read that passage one more time, and then I'm just going to close in prayer. Exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight and not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. It's okay to look for glory if you look at the right place. Right? I'm saying that to pastors, saying that to elders, leaders. It's okay. Jesus condemned the people who were looking for glory from humans as opposed to the glory that comes from God. The Gospel of John talks about that. That's where they were wrong. It's okay to say, Father, was that good? Did I do okay? Are we doing all right? Did I please you? That's okay. It gets tricky when I'm like, oh, I wonder if the church liked my message today. It's like, why does that even matter? I don't know. It does. I don't know. It's weird. 
When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Let me pray for us, Father, Chief Shepherd. <laughs> Jesus has told us to be uh, careful and aware that, uh, that He's coming. He will appear, and we want to be um, aware of that. We want to have um, our hearts set on what is true and right and good and pure and noble. And, and God, we are, we are just often distracted. Some of us have given up areas of leadership in our lives. We've, we've said, no, I'm just going to let things go. Maybe as a parent, maybe as a leader, maybe as a manager, maybe as a, as a grandparent, we just maybe just let it go instead of taking courage to, to lead in, in the way you've asked us to lead. So wherever you want to land this today, I ask that you would do a work in us um, so that you can do a work through us, that the work that you do would um, bear the fruit that you, you desire in our lives, that we would, as a flock, multiply, that we would find that you have been at work. We ask for many to see and fear and put their trust in you, Jesus. God, I'm just aware right now that we're all influenced we're all affected. We're all being moved and pushed and herded. And, and, so, and so we just look to you, the chief shepherd, to guide us, to lead us. For those of us that are driven, help us be led by the chief shepherd. Father, we just submit ourselves to you. We ask for you to do the work in us. We ask for our hearts to be made pure before you, but only you can do that. And so we just submit ourselves to you. Amen.